Here we are. Thank you so much for being here with me. Welcome to TAP. It honestly means the world to me that you are here. It truly does. And yet on the other side of that sweet statement, you know, is that I'm becoming more and more aware that I walk alone boulevard of broken dreams <laughs> by green day if you uh, if you know that band it's an it's, it's an old one but i just I, f- i feel it's so relevant i love that song if you've ever listened to the lyrics like something like read between the lines and everything's all right check my vital signs to know i'm alive and i walk alone yeah that's that's my that's my singing for now uh, <laughs> but It's, I like the, the lyrics and the whole shadow. I'm just here walking with my shadow and walking a lonely road. Uh, I was just in a meeting just now, just an hour ago, this meeting ended where I got some coaching on my business. So I'm not, okay, I'm going to put some context to this. I don't think that I shared this before. Maybe I did in this podcast. I'm not sure. But the thing is, I work as a social worker. It's one of my educations and it's one of the things that's it's been the easiest to get a, a job with with that education but i recently quit that job uh, as a social worker i was uh, provoked so i, I, I don't want to say like an impulsive decision but i do want to say a, a triggered one <laughs> uh, but Not like I did it in one moment because I did consider it. Yeah, and so the the situation was that I had to change offices. So the office I was at was going to shut down, and not only were I going to change office just from one day to the next, I was told that I was going to get a new supervisor, new colleagues, and and I I've really played this in my mind several times, especially when I had to make the decision of what to do. And also just why did it trigger me so much and what I came to for conclusion also through therapy was the thing that where I'm, I'm, I wasn't given a choice. So it was my way of saying no, like it was the only way I had to say no, because if you don't quit, then you have to do this thing, right? So I wanted to say no. So I had to, I choose to, I don't want to say it with necessity because I, I did choose to quit. Anyway, my last day as a social worker is here in August 2023. And so I've been applying for a bunch of jobs and going to interviews too, failing at them big time. (laughs) It's a kind of situation where you're trying to tell them what you can do and they don't really want that. And then you're trying to tell them you can do what they want and then they can hear that that's not something that you're very passionate about. So I'm, again, finding myself, I've done this in in my past, in a situation where I'm trying to set up a business so I can live from that. And I did share with you how well it went last time. Okay, the coach here for this meeting that I'm talking about just told me to... Well, he, he said that this whole combination of therapy and astrology that's really the heart of what I'm doing I wish you could narrow it down to one word but I'm not sure anyone would understand that Uh, he said there's no market for it and he's actually right about that because astrology clients they come because they want to know about themselves maybe they know some astrology Usually it's like that, that they know pieces of astrology and then they kind of want the whole synthesized uh, reading by a professional astrologer. And they don't come there to work on themselves. They don't come there to work in therapy, which you do in therapy. You know, it's not really the astrologer or the therapist uh, that's working. It's the client. And therapy clients, well... (laughs) When they're in crisis, where do they turn to? Usually it's psychiatrists or someone else who is more socially validated, socially accepted than someone like me, who's also an astrologer. So it was a long coaching, a few hours, and we ended up working on my Danish website because the English one, therapeuticastrologer.com, I really like that one. And I've My heart is just, I no, I'm not changing that. I like that one. 
Uh, and that's where tap belongs. This podcast is is kind of designed around that too. So, but the Danish website could be changed, and so what we're changing it for is to say that I am providing coaching because I'm also a certified coach, and to be a coach is socially acceptable. <laughs> and it was really interesting talking to this um, business advisor. Because he said to him, therapy is for sick people. Mm. Mm. And I was like, oh, right. There are other people out there than my parents who have these prejudices and misunderstandings around therapy. Because I don't engage usually with people like that. <laughs> I don't have longer conversations with people like that so I didn't I kind of forgot that prejudice and that completely I think misconception of therapy that it has to do with uh, sick people but so he he said I should call it coaching and it seems it seems really reasonable because I will be doing the same thing and I don't care what the name is I'll be doing the exact same thing I'm not going to then all of a sudden go back to my coaching degree and do what we did there. I mean, you're always drawn what you know, right? But the, the product I have is a finished product. I promise you, I promise anyone, I promise the universe, I promise myself that this is a finished product. Of course, there's always development. It's not like that. But it's, I'm, I'm, there is something here in this combination of astrology and therapy And it just it just works. It just works getting you to where you want, getting you really deep connected to yourself over time, of course, also depending off depending on your, your starting point for sure. But I don't mind calling it something else. But it is a constant theme in my life. Authenticity, selfhood versus how to survive, how to sell, how to communicate to people who don't have access to this profound wisdom. So I relate to the song a lot. That's just what I wanted to say. Boulevard of Broken Dreams by Green Day. I recommend it. And this is this is what you get from me. I usually say said that in my Danish podcast that that my kind of news is it's really old news. When I recommend something You know, people have already forgotten about it <laughs> when I find it. I did find it when it came out, was it 10 or 20 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, and I loved it then as I do now. Okay, but so, yeah, what is that to walk alone? Because I actually was Googling it, walk alone, just to see what came up. And what came up was just people saying, you're not alone. You don't have to walk alone. <laughs> and I was like, no, I was actually looking for this song because I didn't remember the name of it. And that's great. I think it's great that, you know, there's so much out there saying you don't walk alone. But the thing is, I do come from, like I've mentioned before, I come from a childhood of eggshells, of eggshells in the way that we had to walk on eggshells. We had to deny reality to keep everyone Well, safe, but not really safe, more like emotionally numb. And I have repeated that pattern because one thing is to grow up in it. Then you can just, well, you're grown now, you can do something else, right? <laughs> but I have repeated that pattern for many years, disguised in religion, especially religion. Also, I mean, an addition to, but I feel it's like a lot of, The traumatic adaptation that that I've made is part of religion, but you could also say that in addition to religion, I've also been overly relying on the emotional states of others. And I know that there are many ways of being in a, in a religion and you don't have to do that in order to be there. But that's one of the extra, just a bonus that I also had that too. But but I mean, it's really, it's a functional unity with religion. It functions well. It blends in well <laughs> that you're relying so much on policing others and also especially taking the advice of others. And why would you do that? Well, for me, you know, I would do that to stay disconnected. And in that disconnection, 
somehow feeling safe. This is all on an unconscious level. If you would have told me this <laughs> at the time, I'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then I would have given you a Bible and invited you to Bible meetings, you know. So this is all in, in hindsight. Uh, but a, a, a way you can think about it is the message that you took from whatever happened in your childhood. This is really what's important to look at. How did I carry it forth? And and how do I interrupt it, <laughs> right? So from the episode on family estrangement, we learned about togetherness and separateness. There was different words for that, but that's kind of the essence, togetherness and separateness, right, in the family. So you either had a lot of loyalty to relationships in the family, but then that also transpired into other relationships, like you have a duty to come here, you ha- you're obliged, this is your... You have to do this for other people. This is, you know, you don't, you don't get paid. Of course, this is just something that you do for other people. So quite a, a big loyalty around togetherness. And maybe you come from a family where the message was more around separateness that you have to survive on your own, right? You have to be autonomous, and then you've learned about uh, individuality. And I, I mean, both can be very traumatic, but I learned the togetherness part. And and that's, oh, I mean, I think back to all of those gurus, boundaries. I'm going to come back to boundaries in just a moment. But when I, when I think back on that, I wish that I had actually learned about togetherness. But this kind of togetherness is not, <laughs> it's not oh, now she has a great social intelligence, quite the opposite. It's a very dysfunctional, it's, it's the dysfunctions of these themes that I'm talking about, togetherness and separateness, I'm talking about it from a traumatic point of view. So that means I did not have any idea how my internal state influenced others. So my internal state, what even was that, right? I didn't know, I wasn't in contact with it. So when you really want to make relationships and you're all about community, getting people together, being there for other people, all of that is, you know, objectively a good thing. But if I'm not present to my internal state, it, you know, it can go really, it can be really destructive to have someone like that around. So I'm aiming for, the reason why I'm sharing this is, I'm still talking about walking alone, okay? I'm aiming for inner unity, right? Being connected to me and and finding that inner unity in myself rather than trying to have my unmet needs met, which you can't, you know. When I'm talking about unmet needs, I'm talking about early unmet needs, the needs that should have been met when I was a child, and trying to have that met out in the social arena, well, it's going to be very emotionally unintelligent <laughs> because it, it it can't happen. No one can fulfill them. That's what some people call displaced emotions. I remember the first time I read about that, I was like, whoa, that's what I'm doing. Displaced emotions, yeah. So learning to be in the light around what is going on with myself and that means breaking down relationship strategies for example around staying for a party some social event and putting on a good face because yeah because what because it's polite because that's what you do you don't want to disappoint anyone but really you're kind of bored and you don't really want to be there that is over for me. And I've used that strategy many times. It's very culturally embedded in, in many of us to go to these things and not really think about, you know, just kind of be there even though you're bored. There's no problem being there if you're having fun, okay? I'm talking about if you actually feel like being somewhere else. If you're actually just there with your body and then your mind is, you know, trying to entertain itself by being somewhere else. So I'm, I'm talking in very general terms here and it has been 
a thing of mine to criticize for many years now, the whole way that we are gathering and the whole way that I have to yeah, do something at the expense of what I want to do in social situations. But I could also, now I am being a bit personal already with you, I could share with you that the friends that I was talking about in a recent episode, I don't remember which one, but one of the last few (laughs) episodes, I was talking about being really grateful for a text and my point in saying that, I'm pretty sure that it was around how feelings of being inferior can come up and and that relationships is really important for healing. And and I still take away that point. <laughs> I, I just suck every point, every meaning, every lesson there is of my experience. I suck it in. I take it all in. The thing is now that it has kind of developed <laughs> with this friendship. Uh, or maybe actually it has not developed. That's kind of the problem because I was at a social gathering at theirs and I did leave because, and I said I was going to leave, so it's not something very abrupt. I did say, you know, I'm just going to go home and maybe they did not, I cannot speak for them, but maybe they did not quite understand that. And I felt, of course, a little bit, "Mm, should I, should I not? Because, you know, I also want to, I want to question also my impulses because I have a lot of impulses and I certainly should not react to all of them. But I did consider it for a little while and I would say, yeah, it is sure. This is me prioritizing the time I have left in this life. I don't have time for this. This is what it feels in me. And we are going to speak today about the Pluto generation. So, So maybe you can remember this example when I'm talking about Pluto in Scorpio. Because it's really this intense feeling that that life is now, it is not permanent. And yeah, you can go down that road of saying everything is energy, your energy, you're going to be eternal, all of that, and you are eternal. Sure. But me, Mana, this body, (laughs) this life that I have, this identity, all of this I have now is, is really not permanent. It's so short. I don't know how you feel about your days, but I feel I get up in the morning and then two seconds later, it's evening and I've done nothing. <laughs> That's how I feel. I've done a lot. But I just constantly feel there's so much more that I need to do, that I feel like doing, that I especially want to learn, actually. It's a lot with that. I really want to learn. I feel I'm very behind because, like I've shared with you, living in, well, roughly 30 years of religion and every time... You know, I saw anything interesting on television, which was, you know, an an information channel at one point in time. It it got shut down, right? It was like, no, we don't look that here. No, we don't, you know, don't look to the stars if I were asking about that. And and the only source of information that was valid was the Bible. And I am sure that we learned things in school, but... I was, I was so caught up in the social th- things that went on at home that I was not uh, able to focus. That's, it's actually a symptom of complex uh, PTSD for sure, around not being able to focus. Okay, so I felt and feel this pressure of, it's not a bad pressure. It's not like I can, um, it's the opposite of depression. It's a pressure to live. It's an internal pressure to live. It's I have wasted enough time, just enough. So I have these two parts, right? Where I'm at one hand that where I have just which I have just described to you, right? I need to learn. I need more time, and I'm using every moment that I have to open myself up to more, more of life, more of what I am, more of what I can contribute to this world. Because obviously, learning is supposed to help other people too. And then there's this other part where I seriously did leave a religion. I seriously left not only a congregation, several congregations, because I've been in several churches, but I also left 
that easy opportunity of finding community. You probably don't know what I mean if you've not been in a congregation, but once you have, you'll know that if you need friendships, if you don't want to walk alone, that's the easy path. Just go to church because <laughs> they'll take up all of your time, right? There's not going to be a moment left to ever wonder what's the meaning of life. Church activities is going to take up all of your time. So I'm saying it a bit of, in a bit of a funny tone, right? But seriously, around not not being alone, let's put it in a more positive sense, around having family, that's really what it's, what it's about. Having chosen family, right? That is what church is good at. And there is no other opportunity out there as good, as well-established, as well-organized as a church. So... Leaving all of that community obviously also means, okay, now I have to really work hard to make friendships. And I shared with you last time, I think, in some episode anyway, I shared that I feel I've actually always been the one going out knocking on doors to get friendships, but especially after having left church. I mean, that cannot be compared to anything. It's because it is so much easier when you're in that community because you meet people all the time, you volunteer together and you belong together in, in a very special way because you have that community of faith. So there's something very beautiful about it. It's just a problem when you can't have that faith anymore because then there is no community and then there is actually, yeah, whatever the opposite is, alienation maybe. Yeah, so I, I'm i trying to balance these two things. And it, I do choose the road where I walk alone with my shadow. That is the most important thing to me. After so many years of trying to accommodate and not realizing my own internal GPS, my own internal voice, I will rather say, okay, then, you know, I'm, I might lose you. But I am choosing me. So that's what I mean. All of this just to say, <laughs> I'm happy that you are here with me listening to Tab. Because otherwise, why am I even recording my own voice? On the other side, if no one is there, I still choose to do this. I still choose to stand by who I am. And, um, and the rest is up to, I guess, fate and algorithms. Okay, let's get into to this uh, chapter, actually. <laughs> so first we will uh, circle back to the last chapter's theme. You know that structure by now. And then we will focus on some astrology, the Pluto generations in particular. Yeah, so I choose to bring in astrology now because I feel I've mostly focused on what you could call an alternative resume uh, of myself, really, all of these Themes that I've talked about match traumas per quite perfectly. If you think about them, e everything that I've shared about, you know, could be directly related to a, a trauma, and that's why I think it's also relevant for other people to to hear about. But the biggest key that I have found to navigate life as it is and navigate also all of those traumas, all of those uh, patterns, is through. The astrological archetypes. It just brings in a certain relational intelligence, if you will. So we have different types, and there's so many systems about types. I'm actually, I was actually trying this weekend. I don't want to say that I did it, but I was trying to read uh, Jung's um, psychological types. I, if you've read it and if you've enjoyed it, I really want to hear from you because I'm f I feel alone <laughs> with this classic text, the classic book, and I feel it's, oh, uh, yeah, it's really heavy. It's really heavy. I feel asleep a lot, and I don't know, I think I might be in the second chapter, 
And luckily, it's a book that I borrowed on the library, so I'll have to return it. <laughs> uh, anyway, I was trying to read it because I care a lot about types. Um, and when I've read summaries of his very long book, Psychological Types, people just talking about extrovert and introvert. But what I read is, yeah, I can read that, but that the meaning to it is kind of complicated like that. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about... Let's let's say that you have a, a person who has Pluto in Virgo, okay? You have a, a, a person who's from that generation, Pluto in Virgo, who focuses on, well, solving the problem. It's a Virgo thing. Keep adjusting this thing until you get results. My business advisor here, he was very much a Virgo person. <laughs> Sun, Moon, uh, Pluto... Maybe Venus, I think, also in in Virgo. Yeah, so solving the problem, keep adjusting until it's you just get that result that you want. And then you would have another type. You can call it Pluto in Libra type. <laughs> A person who's born in the next generation, who has patterns of compliance instead. And this person just wants to keep everyone happy. Everyone needs to just get along. Let's not rock the boat. And you can see already here, even from such short de descriptions, how these generational themes interact and how they can potentially misunderstand each other. And then you can add Pluto in Scorpio generation, my generation, it's a short one. Want to make everyone happy? Well, I, I mean, I, okay, so let's remember that most of our, us are actually conditioned to that behavior and to a lot of different behaviors. But what Pluto in Scorpio essentially wants is not to make everyone happy. It's to bring about the raw truth. Let me also give you more of an example, because ultimately we don't only look to Pluto in the sign. That's I'm going to go through it, but you need to know that it's, of course, a generalization. It's I mean, when when you really want to know, you go to the full chat. And I was reading, so it's a fun example, I think. I was reading Ernst Hartmann. I'm not done with that because that's really interesting. Really also well written. It's newer text, so I don't want to blame Jung. <laughs> I don't want to blame Jung because he's, he's a master, okay? But it's also just old text. And sometimes it's just written in a, a way where you have had to read a thousand books before that one in order to understand it. And I have not read those thousand books anyway. But Ernst Hartmann, he's an Austrian-American psychiatrist, and he published a book in 2011 called Boundaries, A New Way to Look at the World. Boundaries. Okay, I was like, hmm, that's a Pisces issue, at least not having boundaries. But then it could also be Scorpio because they have boundaries and we're gonna get to why and so i looked up his chart and sure enough he's a six degree pisces meaning he's in in the beginning of the sign and he, ha he has neptune opposite to his son which is just adding to this theme of pisces around boundaries for example and then he has his moon conjunct pluto moon conjunct pluto is obviously giving a, a very scorpionic signature so if you're newer to astrology, I apologize, <laughs> but I will. And if, even if you know astrology, then you might not use it as I'm using it. I will use Pluto, Plutonian and Scorpio as synonymous and also eighth house is part of that archetype. So and so it's in, also it's in Cancer because he's from that generation just before the one that we're going to be starting to talk about today uh, before leo we had the pluto in cancer generation and so the well uh, the whole all of this signature pluto in cancer pluto conjunct the moon both in cancer is absolutely about the healing work that he was doing as a psychiatrist and then the pisces signature gives us even a greater understanding why the issues of boundaries should be really interesting to him. And so Ernest Hartmann speaks of boundaries like people have thin or thick boundaries. And what's even more interesting in this, because we are like we are trying to examine what in a chart makes you care for the things that you do, right? 
And in the chart, so I said we had a lot of water. Let's just keep it to that. We have a lot of water. Okay, so, but but especially Pisces, okay? <laughs> uh, because his research on boundaries, it really grew out of his research on sleep and dreaming, you know, because that's Pisces. And he, what he says is that boundaries cuts across many levels of human experience. So there are boundaries between the state of sleep and waking, between thinking and feeling. There are boundaries between the conscious and the rational processes of the ego and between the chaotic unconscious world of the it. And then most people, he says, falls in between thickness and thinness. We're talking about boundaries here. So you can have a very thick boundary, you can have very thin boundaries, and it reflects some organization in, in the brain. And he studied many people who has taken his uh, questionnaire, the boundary questionnaire. I think you can find it online. And he finds that people differ greatly in the permeability of their boundaries. I really like that permeability. Permeability, yeah, because it reminds me, oh yeah, <laughs> what happens when you don't have boundaries? People can just walk into you, right? So a person who scores as thin on this test, on this questionnaire, is likely to say that you're usually sensitive to loud noises, yep. Usually you're sensitive to bright lights, yep. And also feels sometimes you don't really know who you are, yep. <laughs> and sometimes I don't know what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and am I thinking or am I feeling, all of that. So one thing is that women on the whole have thinner boundaries than men. But I obviously also want to look to the astrology for that conclusion because I do think that water in the chart has a lot to do with this. It can be, you can talk about water, you can also talk about the mutable signs. There, there would be different signatures. Maybe you have Neptune right on, on your ascendant, maybe you have Neptune on your sun or your moon. So I would go into a whole analysis around this, but it's really interesting and he obviously did not use astrology i'm just putting astrology onto him okay but he so what he says uh, in Hartman here is that thicker boundaries people with thicker boundaries they are likely to be married i guess throughout time but then not to enjoy their sex lives as much as the ones with thinner boundaries. So this is really creating a picture, right? And he says that those with peruse boundaries, peruse boundaries, that's so Pisces, report more symptoms of illness and are more likely to dream vividly and to also recall their dreams upon waking. Everyone's boundaries, he says, tends to thicken with age. So, so the, the permeability of boundaries he says, has little to do with how to measure mental illness. And I love this point. So he says that a thin personality may be creative, open to experience, a bit wacky and prone to unusual dreams, but is not psychologically disturbed because of that. But what he says is that whether you are too thick or you're too thin, it has risks. So this is a quote, he says, having boundaries that are too thick and solid makes you incapable of relationships and deprives you of dreams and fantasies. But having no boundaries at all is very dangerous. And for example, if you have very thin boundaries, you can easily plunge into a destructive relationship where you feel that the other person is a part of you, even though that it is destructive. Ha, huh. ha, huh. how are you feeling? hearing this. I hope you're hearing this. Thin is really so much us with uh, a lot of water going on. So it doesn't mean that we're just, you know, th thrown out into the life. You can't do anything about it. It just means here are some lessons, particularly for us. Okay. So it's, I'm kind of sidetracking. I was, I was gonna say, oh, this chart, it just is exactly what he's talking about. It's exactly there in the chart. But I also know that I wanted to mention him because of this point with in terms of boundaries. But it doesn't have anything really to do with the theme today. So 
I guess I don't have too rigid boundaries around my themes either. Okay, so what is Pluto? Pluto, we can call it a lens, It's but it's a deeply rooted lens. So it's not like a personality lens. Because a lens, would you could call the moon a lens. That, that's much more personal. But I... I do want to talk about it as a lens somehow, but it's a deeply rooted one. It's deeply rooted in our inner world. And we take it with us wherever we go, like the rest of our astrology, of course. But this is, because it's so deep, it's really hard to change. By You can just eat a new food and then it's a little different. It's really like a tone, a deep tone that's down there. And it's when we're trying to connect to other people at a deep level that this comes up. So Pluto is our wound. It is our spiritual crisis and it is where we can shift reality and sometimes it's going to be shifted for us. Like I said, Pluto is really defining a generation. You can say it's together with Neptune because in our lifetime it's in sextile to Neptune. So, but, but so it points to the light within us when we enter the dark, when we go from ignorance to illumination, which happens when we are awake to the deeper meaning of life. So when I'm going to go through this, of course, I can only make a general distinction. You always have to investigate the whole chart of the person. When I looked at Ernst Hartmann here, of course, I had the Pluto in Cancer. The conjunction to the moon is a big one. And and the Neptune signature was a big one. So it's of course, it's all of the chart always because we are unique souls and we have unique storylines. But nevertheless, we do belong to a certain group identity. So I will talk mainly of Pluto in this chapter, but most of the time you have to remember that it's together with Neptune, it's together with maybe other outer planets that's in its in a sign for a long time, so that you know that it has a great effect on the generation too. Pluto, I cannot we cannot, I don't think we can speak enough about Pluto. I feel that every time someone shares about Pluto I learn something new and I've been listening to it for many years now. So it relates to intimacy, it relates to bonding, and it relates to sincerity. So like I said, it comes up when we want to connect with someone, but Pluto demands of us to also be sincere, because it has to do with getting the truth up into the light. So last time I spoke a bit about a very tender theme for me. I was actually going to circle back to that. I just, <laughs> this is a, a very chaotic episode, but it's a good one. I promise you it's a good one. Uh, f- but let me just circle a little bit back before I go into the Pluto generations here um, to the theme of having adopted my son. I'm still not sure how to say that correctly. Not even in Danish. It sounds weird whenever I try to say it. But yeah. That my biological son has another family. To put it like that. So I don't feel like talking about it in my everyday life much. But like I said in in the last chapter. I do feel like talking about it publicly. At a gathering with people who for some reason has a personal interest in it. That's really the difference. Because in my everyday life usually I don't meet people who... I mean, I don't feel like sharing something that private and tender if people have no prerequisite to relate to it, really. And, okay, I can relate this to Pluto, actually, because I have Pluto in the fourth house in Scorpio. Just let's stay with that little signature. The best way I've heard this signature explained or just worded is a splintered inner world. That is so Pluto fourth house. And it's about the lesson is about learning to sustain yourself and to take in real nourishment, not mistake nourishment for for what it's not something toxic that you think that is actually going to nourish you. Accepting real support rather than someone that's going to control you. And adding Scorpio, I mean, Scorpio is 
is also part of that because you have Pluto there, so it's that archetype. But then you are adding more Scorpio energy on the Scorpio, if you understand. It's really doubling up here. Then you could say that it's knowing the pain. The lesson is knowing the pain. Again, light to the dark, right? Bringing consciousness to the unconscious. Because otherwise, what happens if we don't know the pain? Then we potentially reenact it, usually reenact it through a present relationship. You reenact something old, you reenact the pain. And so Pluto in the fourth house in Scorpio, it signifies a lot of terror around family, it signifies shame, and it means being disconnected to your inner internal experience. And then later, it means that you need to find a new support system. You you can't stay in that shithole, so <laughs> in that destructive uh, house. So this whole adoption theme, it is definitely it's also to relate, related to Pisces because that's around letting go, and and it's one of the global signs, so it's less personal. But but Pluto in the fourth house, it's it's really an extreme of redefining family, redefining family. And also redefining what I deserve. Because after what happened, I was constantly doubting if I deserve to be happy. Every time I would do something or feel something nice, I was like, ah, do I deserve that? Because I gave away my son. Right? I, I was really just, yeah, you can call that shame. I mentioned that. So redefining what it is that you to serve what it is you need for nourishment. And the first step in that is to be available to yourself, be available to your authentic parts that have been split off. Because then you can find real love and real support rather than just, again, getting caught up in fear and gaslighting, shaming, manipulation, what you're used to. So I have made enormous changes Pluto is so much about changes. I have made great changes to what I came in with. For example, only prioritizing faith to now also caring a lot about knowledge that I so intensely yearn for. And changing in a Plutonic sense of the word is around shadow work. It is around what is true. What is true friendships? What are their inner motives? What are my inner motives? And for me, practically, it has meant shifting network and friends many times over. So, okay, we're talking about me, but we're talking about Pluto in the fourth house in general. We're talking about especially together with Scorpio. If you recognize these themes that I'm talking about, I should have said that in the beginning, actually. Just remember, first of all, it can be in your unique chart that you have Pluto somewhere really significant and then that's gonna be the same for you and then just in general I want to remind us all that we are all of the 12 archetypes so don't feel discouraged if I'm describing one archetype that you don't know that you are part of or is a part of you and and you recognize what I'm talking about okay so so just um take it all as I guess wisdom and life philosophy, even though whether you have it in your chart or not. So, but Pluto in the fourth house, it's really what I've just shared with you that that I have also as a child needed to walk out there because my family was never ever enough for me. I needed to walk out there, try to get friends and risk looking stupid, risk the feeling of well, being a stalker, which also relates to Scorpio, risk that. Or even a very needy person that relates to cancer in the fourth house. So you're risking being perceived in a certain way and ask, do you want to play with me <laughs> as a child? And I, I ask people still, do you want to play with me? And, you know, someone told me, yeah, I'm going to share this. I just decided I'm going to share this. Someone told me recently that... She heard this in a Danish podcast that the host was speaking of guests who invite themselves 
into the podcast and I understand the trouble of that having had a podcast w- w- with interviews and I'll, I'll say for my part I'm I usually enjoyed when people were texting me and asking if they could come on to the podcast if I wanted to interview them because it did a service to my ego I guess it kind of made me feel oh then I'm not just making this up some people actually want to be interviewed interviewed by me so I you know I kind of enjoyed it but then I also relate to the struggle of it because I really struggled with when to say no because uh, is this theme gonna fit in and does it this person even fit with my inner resonance or is it slightly off and will the audience maybe relate to it just because I don't so uh, all of this inner turmoil you know which is such a process maybe you recognize it from other areas in your life maybe you don't I hope you don't but but if you do it's it's just a part of getting to know your own GPS right so I basically said yes to everyone because that was just easier so I, so I would say yes for them to come on the show but then I would feel annoyed afterwards that kind of bitter feeling of having spent time and energy on something that may not have lived up to my standard so I t- today I will for sure, handle it very differently. Surely today I would just have new lessons. (laughs) It's never over. It would just be the next level of that. But but yeah, so that's kind of the trouble. Now, now actually, there's one more trouble when people ask me, and now I'm saying that in present tense, when they ask me to be on the show, is that it's been shut down for almost a year. And I feel so offended when people still ask me that's that's a problem because they haven't even checked the podcast they they haven't even seen that my last episode is like goodbye I'm never coming back you know they can easily see that this is a closed podcast and when they ask anyway now can I come on I really f- yeah I don't answer because I just feel offended <laughs> that they just want their publication out there and they don't really care about the individual podcaster who's not hired by anyone and all of that. Take your time to get to know the podcaster and then you can invite yourself for sure. So, but, so this person said that in this podcast, the host had said, it's so annoying with people inviting themselves to the podcast. And then she said, it's just like when you invite yourself over at someone's house and you just don't do that and I was oh no because I just related to the first part she shared and now this and I became just as upset as the person who told it to me because it's not the same and to say that you can't go and invite yourself over that moral is really making it hard for someone like me to ever meet anyone new ever (laughs) okay so my point here is that Yes, this is the risk that you take with Pluto in the fourth house in Scorpio. This is the emotional risk that you have to run because you might meet this arrogant person, someone like this podcast host who opens the door and then just see how sad it is that you don't already have friends. I mean, when I write something on social media, for example, I take a moment to calm myself. And I say, okay, even if no one responds, which happens often, (laughs) most of the time, uh, if no one responds, I want to put this out there anyway. I 100% love and accept myself just the same, no matter with their reactions. And so I take responsibility for whatever happens here when I run that risk, when I show up vulnerable. I'm not putting that on someone else. You don't have to open your home. I really hope you don't open your home if it's a no. I want to honor your yes and your no. And that's the best thing in the world when someone has probably deconditioned themselves to actually say yes when they mean yes and no when they mean mean no because it's again a cultural thing that's come in and many of us get confused. Is it yes or is it no? So just because I knock on a door... The person don't have to say yes to it, but I want it to be allowed. I want it to not be a taboo for people to ask for friends. I'm gonna 
give my life for that. <laughs> no, uh, I, I feel strongly about things and sometimes I feel like I want to die for this. This is so important for me. And that is one of the, the points, absolutely, is that we need to be open about, hey, do you want to be my friends? Hey, do you want to come out and play? And we can't promise each other eternal friendships just, you know, from the first time we hang out, I realize that. But it has to start somewhere. And I've met enough closed-minded people to get triggered around this issue. Uh, how especially some parts of Denmark where it's just so unnatural to be with anyone else than your family, your biological family. And that is sick for someone like me to hang out with. <laughs> that is just making it so hard to be okay inside. But that is the risk that you run. And I think it's absolutely worth running that, being vulnerable, being open to be hurt, okay, being open to be rejected. But then the thing about autonomy, the thing about authenticity is that you can actually leave. The thing about agency, right, that you can actually leave and you can say, well, I tried this and they're not my people and I'm going to find my people somewhere else. And that's absolutely the journey. If you've left a, a community, then you, 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 you have to do that because you can't stay alone uh, forever. Please don't stay alone forever. Walk alone, but don't stay alone. Yeah, I'm sure you get it. Okay, I'm gonna go into the notes I have on Pluto now, and I'm not directly referring to any one particular astrologer, but I am in the evolutionary line of astrology. And I am going to, I think, quote Jeffrey Wolf Green, because uh, I reread uh, the chapters on Pluto and these signs for this episode. Because it's it's just such a classic book, and it's amazing how many details he he's got in there. So to me, Pluto, just again to repeat what Pluto is, because it is so many things. So I don't think. We ever should tire of listening to that. Pluto shows the struggle to become an authentic adult connected to our true self. How do you like that? The struggle to become an authentic adult connected to our true self. And Pluto wants us, or even demands us, to heal at all levels of experience, cognitive, physically, and especially emotionally, because that's where the integration happens. And that, of course, then is projected into relational healing as well. So with Pluto, it gets real and we see what's really there. I actually just have a little quote here from Stephen Forrest's book on Pluto. I've quoted that before, where he says, The ripening of the unconscious mind and our potential readiness to integrate wounded aspects of ourselves is signaled by Plutonian triggers. So the ripening, being ready for your unconscious mind to be ready to integrate wounded parts of ourselves. So when Pluto transits a sensitive point in your chart, it's a time where you feel rejected, where you are rejecting yourself, most likely. And this can happen as a process of opening up and somehow you face limitations. Something tends to break down though. Something in your life from where it seems it comes from the outside and something just you can't rely on it anymore. It's really your calling to change and to break old patterns and to overcome what your insecurities is about. For example, so I'm just using myself an example again. What could a Pluto in the fourth house be insecure about? Well, does anyone want to be with me? Does anyone want to play with me? That could be an insecurity. And how do you get over that? Well, to deal with the loss, process the emotion, because the voice asking, does anyone want to be with me? It's really not from the present. It's from the past. Okay, So that's with the unmet, early unmet emotions. And Pluto is more about descending, more about embodying than ascending, going upwards. Because when you're down there, when you're in, in the matter, you learn to see what's behind the surface, what's really truth. And maybe 
you are kind of on this journey and it, it happens to you and maybe this plutonian change comes unexpectedly that's a likely one but then it can also be through another person some things someone show up in your life and that person that thing takes you to the next level so right now for all of us we uh we have the ingress of pluto to the sign of aquarius that and aquarius is a sign that wants more consciousness and enlightenment and ascension like i just said that's the higher vantage point actually what's the best for society what's the best for the group how are the solutions we can find when we look at things from the outside for from an, an upper perspective and it can mean changes for you on the level of friends and partnerships now i'm coming to you here from a <laughs> venus retrograde so i'm sure that partnerships is on the forefront for many people but this is a much 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 longer <laughs> transit it's a transit of 20 years it's not even really ingressed into aquarius yet it takes time and it's not stay it's not there until i think it's november 24 that it's actually gonna stay for for many years 20 years so it's it's a theme in the long run that could mean that you are going to join a new network of people with new ideas so maybe just your old friends are getting new ideas <laughs> i mean ideas in aquarius means new solutions new solutions we're not familiar with and how does that feel uh, we need to do something we're not used to it doesn't feel great at first but it is something that will upgrade you improve your life conditions and with Aquarius, it also, it brings rapid development. So it means it can happen really fast where you are thrown into this situation and it just happens much faster than you anticipated. I, when I forget about what Aquarius is, I just look to my Aquarius friends. I have Aquarius on my descendant, meaning I attract that and I love that quality of Aquarian, Aquarian girls, um, anyone, anyone Aquarius really. Uh, they their lives is just something a little thing happen and you think oh, it's gonna take a while and they're just the next day they've moved out they've gotten a new job they're doing this crazy new thing because <laughs> that's just what happens in Aquarius you know you just it, it's faster than you anticipate and then what can happen with Aquarius is that you can increase too fast if you increase too fast then you just you just have to go back. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Aquarius is used to it. You just have to go back, digest what has happened before moving on. So it's an ad advice for all of us in this time that when there are a lot of things happening, just remembering the emotional part so it's not going to be so hard to actually go back a little bit and then you can move forward. But all of this, of course, for you personally, it depends on where Pluto is in your charts and where it's transiting also what house and and also where uranus is right now because uranus is direct channel is uranus when we talk about the sign uh, aquarius so but the reason why it's actually quite important with the, this ingress into aquarius is that as we're going to learn and i think we've already mentioned right with pluto generations here it it's such a huge deal. It's such a great, great effect. So potentially this can point you and us in a completely new direction. And Aquarius, if you if you want to have three E words, we can say equality, emancipation, and elevation. I think those are really good E words for Aquarius. So what kind of direction will something around this, something around being more liberated, being able to look at your life from from greater ideas than the ones that are going on right now so let's talk about the generations pluto in leo so if you wonder where your pluto is in what sign i urge you to go look it up because because there, there are all these uh, different dates when you when you're looking at when was Pluto in Leo because because and all of the signs because there are these retrogrades so I'm just gonna say the first date and then I can say the first and the last date and then you can just look up because then you might think that you have Pluto in Leo if I just say these two but you yeah, there could be a retrograde so maybe you don't but 
from the October 7th, 1937 until October uh, 1956. So again, it's around 20 years. And I will title every one of these generations. How do you like that? So the title of Pluto in Leo, I'll call it Celebrate Life. And then please don't become self-indulgent and manipulate to get acknowledged. So Pluto in Leo, how are they? Who are they? What are they up for? They are really generous and romantic and passionate people, also ambitious because they feel that they have this unique and special purpose inside. And Jeffrey Wolfgreen says on page 103 in the Pluto book, first one, because the evolutionary desire and intent from the past has been to actualize and establish the special creative purpose, these individuals have necessarily required intense inner focus and determination to shape their destiny. This generation is, of course, faced with the abuse of power because just as Pluto ended Leo, the war broke. Leo is life, Pluto is death. So the will to live, the will to survive death. It's also the generation of the baby boomers. It's all about creating, getting having a legacy, having your story noticed and remembered. And the interesting thing here is that now Pluto in Aquarius is right opposite that Pluto in Leo. And with Pluto, we talk about a polarity points. Now, in within evolutionary astrology, there are nuanced differences. So actually, the one that I'm studying with right now, Maurice Fernandez, is not talking about a polarity point like that. But the more, I guess, classical illusionary astrologists do. So so right now, Pluto is in Aquarius, or I think right now it's, as you're listening to this, it's it's in um, the late degrees of, it's in 29 degrees of Capricorn, but I'm just rounding it up. We're, we're in this year where the ingress is happening, right? And Pluto is opposing Leo, and it means it's on these people's polarity points. So th- it means that, these people might be propelled to do something socially useful. That the elites are starting to do shadow work. I'm trying to be positive here. <laughs> At least they need to do shadow work. But it, you know, it might propel them to get a little bit outside of just how can I express myself, and then more into how how can I contribute to progress for all. And and also, it has to do with the right use of technology. Now, there's also something interesting around genders in Leo Aquarius. So it could be a gender revolution, but then these people are quite old. So maybe not so much a revolution. Maybe they're just going to stay really long alive (laughs) and still have their life and their vitality. And and maybe technology is going to play a big part in prolonging their lives. And redefining what it means to be old, redefining how you can express yourself as an old person, as a senior. Yeah, so that is pretty short around Pluto and Leo. And now I'm going to do three, I think, fairly long ones. (laughs) So if you're not already lying down, (laughs) you can do that or you could save this for when you have time. So I'm going to do uh, three long ones and then just a few comments to the rest. I should also mention that when I go through this, I will say positive things. I will say negative things. And what's up with that? Well, n- not all of it is going to come through in one person. Uh, y- you you can take the high road or the low road and y- many things can happen in life and developments and all of that. Uh, and... I mean, now I didn't really go that deep into Pluto and Leo, but for some of us, it is the parents we've grown up with and we'll know that there are really narcissistic tendencies here. These are people who, well, there was there was war and maybe they didn't experience it, but then their parents did. So obviously they're affected by it and... Many will have that symptom of of not having been seen. And when you haven't been seen, well, we all need attention, right? We need attention. I hate when people say something like, oh, they're so attention-seeking as a negative thing. 
<laughs> have you heard that? Oh, it's just she's just uh, seeking attention. I think I touch upon it with uh, the suicide attempts. You know, people could say something of the sorts in regards to, to that. But really, just even with kids, I I don't care what age you are. We all need attention. If someone is seeking attention, then you know we should look at them. If it's someone that we love or care for, not just I'm not not just someone on the social media, we could just turn that off. But if it's someone we are in a relationship with or that we want to care for, then we give our attention. And I think working as a therapist is it's a lot about attention because I make many mistakes. You know, afterwards I reflect about the of the process I'm like oh yeah probably I shouldn't have said that I should have catched that I should have done that and that's a big part of examining myself and also examining my practice it's not a critique when I go into shaming myself about it or putting pressure on myself I know I'm in a strategy and I'm not being being true to what I want but I do go through it like that how I can maybe show up methodically different next time or better next time but knowing, knowing that what is the most healing is the presence, that you are actually there and your head is not all in the theory, you're all in the method, but that you're actually there showing up with your attention for the other person. Anyway, <laughs> sidetracking, but that's just Pluto and Leo. You know, we might have had very negative experiences with this generation if you have experienced uh, someone being very narcissist, narcissistic. Um, so, high and low road. Virgo. Let's go to Virgo. It's from October 20, 1956, and then it does not leave until 1971. So, again, it's a long one, from 56 to 71. And I have titled Wir Pluto in Virgo Generation as Purification, Self-Improvement, willing to help and to serve the whole and then please don't overanalyze your own shortcomings so this is a transitional sign now let me start by saying that it's the generation of industrialization and from 1961, also Uranus was in the sign of, of Virgo. So there's a lot of finding flaws to improve function. Observing reality to contrast reality with ideals. So these people, Pluto and Virgo, they unconsciously attract situations where they must be at service to the whole. So they're here to serve. And they're or actually, you can say that they're here to free themselves from dysfunction. I think that's actually more accurate. But service is like a byproduct of that. But they're here to free themselves from dysfunction. And I have often heard people from this generation when they are they become speakers and you know they inspire the rest of us, what they talk about is accepting yourself accepting yourself loving yourself and and so this has really been a personal issue for them and the polarity point that i mentioned before i didn't really explain it but it's really just a balancing point that you have to grow into is in pisces which is about that lesson of accepting yourself so let's read what jeffrey wolfgreen says it's at page 115 those with Pluto in Leo, the generation before, okay? Those with Pluto in Leo learn to identify the creative principle and purpose from within themselves. In order to do so, they necessarily had to unite emotionally with the creative principle to actualize their purpose. This led to the creation of a pyramid effect in which the individual was on the top of the pyramid, expecting all other factors in their lives to revolve around and serve and serve their needs. In Virgo, so Pluto and Virgo, the pyramid now becomes inverted. The individual is at the bottom in order to serve the needs of the whole through work, a service, a, a service function that that has been assigned or chosen. I just like that 
metaphor of the pyramid. So the triangle here is like turning and you go in the bottom, but don't be mistaken because they are powerful. Okay, so Pluto in Virgo, they have to learn practical methods. They basically come in with that because they have had to learn these in past lives, the techniques, the skills, and they just know how to apply this function, this work within a society. So they are really resourceful. They can fix things. <laughs> Underscoring that, fixing things. And so they're here to f be free from dysfunction, right? And it means they can really not tolerate incompetence and deficiencies. It means that they are really detail-oriented. They're very precise. And sometimes that can come out in a not-so-great way, in a sarcastic way even. So you can, if you go through stand-up comedians and go through their science, that's also a, a quite a, a fun exploration if you go into that. But they, So they can be sarcastic. It's not only that they are self-conscious, because they are, but they are making other people self-conscious and other people are uncomfortable. Oh, okay, I have to pull in my stomach here because he's making jokes about this, you know, something to do with that. Uh, but but the evolutionary intention is to heal and better function also in relationship. So in a positive response is to, you know, they see the dysfunction and then rather than just, you know, letting it out, letting it slide out in some sarcastic way, then to have that conversation and relationship to figure out how to live together. And what we assume about this generation, Pluto in Virgo is that they have had past lives with dysfunctional relationship. So they're really here to elevate relationships, to make relationships better. So their criticism can come out um, hurting other people, but it's not meant to be toxic. It's not meant to destroy. It's meant to identify blocks. And so, because they, they see how you can make this better. And there's also the side of Pluto and Virgo that's restless. They are Virgoholics, they're perfectionists. And it all comes down to not being satisfied. Again, because they're here to change, change the problem. So they will analyze, strategize, and they will almost go into surgery, do whatever it takes of precision to heal what is sick. And that's also on an internal level because Pluto is so much about the depth of you. So they will self-analyze and they will adjust and they will find new methods. And ultimately, they will purge the egocentric patterns inside and, and develop a quality of humility. You probably know this from Virgos, right? So this is a generational theme of having that quality of humility. And it can lead to either a, a conscious uh, standard of right conduct, this is the way we do it here, or it can be unconscious, so it translates in, unfortunately, to this feeling you have that you should have done this, so you should have been that. So that that is really relating to one of the darker sides to this archetype that, that will go seems to have a need for atoning, atoning for the guilt that is experienced. And, and it's really some leftovers from past lives uh, where it can create in this life a reality structure that is full of crisis. It means that if, if they go into the low version of that, they hold themselves back from fulfilling their talents, from fulfilling their capacities. And then they deny themselves, they sacrifice themselves, they doubt themselves. Usually also they become sick. And so if it's sickness or something else, but there will come a crisis. If you are on the low road, there will come a crisis. And then that is going to promote that you improve yourself and that you have more knowledge about yourself and the whole self-destructing impulse is brought to life. So this is 
really because that their in the Virgo archetype is a conflict between spirit and flesh. So in a relationship, it can look like this. It's not a very great expression, but it's actually quite common that you attract a reliable partner. So we're talking about Virgo, Pluto in it Virgo. It could also be other Virgo uh, signatures, actually. But it's it's strong here with Pluto because it is so much about our deeper sexuality and oftentimes unconscious sexuality. So you can attract a partner that's really reliable. It's really a Virgo partner. But then you have this need to have a secret partner to go wild with on the side. So it's this need on the one hand to have be very controlled on the surface and you have a partner that you know it just fixes things like you and are controlled and 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 where you agree somehow to put mind over matter head over animal so you are controlling all of these instinctual needs so you attract this partner who's civilized who dresses well who's clean who looks healthy but it is at the expense of uh, the desire in the relationship and yeah, then the, the shadow of Pluto is then to go out with someone else and live out that sexual fantasy rather than working on it in the relationship. I just want to mention that this generation will then have the sextile to Neptune in Scorpio. It's interesting because this generation, they were born here so 20 years later when Pluto was in Scorpio, you know, they learned about AIDS. So, and this is Neptune in Scorpio, which is could be around disease transmission. So, but but it's also that they come in with knowledge uh, they learned in this time around reincarnation and alternative healing, and and then the whole sexual approach became more loose and more promiscuous. So, but so we're talking about. Pluto and Virgo, Neptune, Scorpio, and this is a generation together. And I'm not exactly sure what is what, but I know that this generation can be neurotic. And we do know that from the old Freudian text that there's a relationship here between neurosis and uh, suppressed sexuality. But it is a, a generation that's very body perfecting. We're not at the body positive yet, not at all. Body perfecting, Puritans, and they often wear a lot of makeup. They're often somehow showing that they're really not comfortable in their body. They have a fear of imperfection. So this is, again, they come here to be free of dysfunction, but then it can, in a human form, translate into a fear of anything that's not clean and that translates also into what they want in a relationship because Pluto has to do with that deeper attraction so they want a partner that looks good and who has a strong immune system and and there's there can also be a fear in sexuality because they can be afraid not to perform as is expected on all areas of life but also in sexuality so there's a lot of lessons again around accepting yourself and I hope you heard me when I mentioned that with spiritual leaders from this generation talking about accepting yourself I think it is so interesting <laughs> how we say what's in our planets we speak our planets right it's so interesting but I will go down that road some other time because I have many ideas around the implications of that but so Virgo here, Pluto and Virgo, accepting yourself, accepting the mess of life, accepting the mess of being a body. And then there is this need to free oneself from the mind, the critical mind. And the intention is for this generation, for, that, for spirit to support the body rather than having too high standards of being clean, of being beautiful in a certain way, beauty ideals. And because those beauty ideals are put on themselves as a heavy weight and it's put on others. I'm, I'm calling it a heavy weight. For them, it's natural. For them, it's, oh, it, it doesn't look correct. Let's fix it, right? Let's take it out. Let's pull over here and fix your nose. Now it's good. 
but you really want to have the spirit to support the body and not to be so so critical so but so so Virgo is is also what represents sacred sexuality and sexuality for ritual purposes for healing purposes and part of their sexual journey is stepping out of repression of uh, repressed sexuality and into the consciousness of healing which of course requires what these people talk about accepting yourself as you are so it's a, a very great wisdom again for all of us but especially for this generation i hope you're still with me we have a lot to go through <laughs> so i hope you're with me okay so pluto in libra it is from october 71 to 1983 again around 20 years a little more and i'm gonna mention that it's also the sextile to neptune in Sagittarius because this means that it's fire and air it's so expansive and it's two of the third quadrant signs it means that they are really idealistic and adventurous it just means that this is signature going together that's really making this a big deal and the title not forgetting that part the title i've made is and i've only made the titles exactly for this episode um if you meet me somewhere else i might completely forget about these titles it's only just you have it now and it's gone forever i'll make new titles but the titles that i've made is learning to participate in relationships with something that is outside of myself please don't that's a please don't please don't spiritually bypass and but also please participate in the ecstatic but don't avoid psychologically processing i have so much to say around spiritually bypassing because it's been a, a great deal in my life and it's really really hurtful to the people who's around you and i'm sure i've hurt a lot of people by being in that psychological place and i've also been hurt by it but let's start with the real intention for this generation because that is around peace justice balance and it's all found through an objective awareness where you have this generation has forces in negotiation reconciling opposites and they can be really socially intelligent because they need to engage in a wide variety of relationships and it's in plural it's not just one relationship so divorcing is an option but it's it's important for them to be exposed to many different people and relationships to different people because it's so inspiring with other people's uh, value systems with their way of intelligence with the way of thinking spiritually with their beliefs all sorts of different systems so that they understand the other person's point of view that's the libra but when we have the sign we also need pluto which is also the shadow <laughs> that's why it can become dark here now there are different ways you can mask the truth for this generation it could be the mask of being appropriate the mask of appropriate so we don't speak about it because it's not polite we all know that this person was sexually abused but we don't speak about it because it's not appropriate another way you can mask the truth is that you understand the other person's point of view so much that's a good thing that's a liberal thing you really understand the other person's point of view but then rather than being true to yourself you just play back the reality of others to them and it can be consciously but i think often pluto and libra people don't feel that they belong to themselves in, on the inside because libra is this quality where you constantly compare yourself to what other people are doing so i really think that the origin of this is is mostly because of that not belonging inside yourself rather than something very strategic plus of course many of Plu- pluto in libra's relationships are going to be with pluto in libra's <laughs> they're, they're going to have a bunch of relationships within that generation so one will take one role and the other will 
lose herself in that relationship. So there are going to be lessons with different uh, power power dynamics. So Neptune and Sagittarius, that was in 1970. Yeah, so it is that whole generation. And it's uh, where you have Pluto and Libra and you have Neptune and Sagittarius. And it's all about exploring other people's ideas. It's this great need to learn and to travel and visit different cultures, explore sexuality, explore relationships. And this generation, I feel we owe them a lot because they broke down patterns and did not just repeat what their parents did. And they're not inspired by security, but where, which you, of course you are in, in Virgo. But in this generation, you're inspired by meaningfulness and exploration. It's about the higher mind and you're not interested in the practical room, which uh, Virgo is. So you, so you don't care about the material. You want to explore other ways of living, religions, relationships, cultures. So potentially, you're a very open-minded person. And I want to thank that generation for bringing in the divorce as something normal and also opening up for different ways of being uh, a family. I just want to use this opportunity <laughs> to talk about a shadow we can call spiritual bypass. Because this generation of Pluto and Libra, there's this tendency to step out of yourself. And it can be a very good thing. So all I'm asking, all we are asking here is that you examine yourself to see what it is. I'm going to define it. So this is from Craig Caswell. So he says that spiritual bypass refers to the unhealthy misuse of spiritual life to avoid dealing with psychological difficulties. So it's really a misuse of spiritual beliefs to defend what we can call emotional repression. And it's very related to something that I have internalized, which does not reflect my true nature at all, but that I was taught to be. I was taught, as so many of us, <laughs> as so many of us, and it's just all about me, but it might be about you too, to avoid genuinely examining thoughts and feelings, because that is really, if you if you don't examine yourself, you're a perfect candidate for manipulation and everything that goes on inside a church and a religion. And the really heartbreaking thing here, it is so heartbreaking to me, is that you're using these spiritual beliefs because it's all about love and, it's, and you can be in this ecstasy, right? So it, it involves a lot of your biology too, but you can also really be in your heart and you just, you just want love and you just... You're just here for love, right? And then you use that vulnerability, really, to defend in authenticity. It, it reminds me, actually, of... Um, I've been reading Wilhelm Reich, and it's better than the one that I referred to by Jung in terms of what I understand, but it's still... It's still boring, but there is there are pieces that are not boring, and um, and he has this case with a client. It's really interesting. It's a client who keeps smiling. So the problem is this constant smile that is he can't take it off his face. And he and I think in the beginning he's doing it consciously, but it also seems he just can't get rid of it. And the client is also wondering why the smile is there, but he just needs to smile. And so what Reich then finds out is that. He calls it the infantile material, meaning that this is a fear of being deserted by his mother, of being cut out. And the smile is somehow protecting him from that also in the present because there's this whole projection going on. So smiling as a defense mechanism, that is what this reminds me about. Oh, everything is all right. I'm destroyed on the inside, but, you know, it's all good. Okay, let's here because Craig Caswell, I have another quote I wanted to read here in his article. He says, spirituality is a way of life that affects and includes every moment of existence. It is at once a contemplative attitude, a disposition to a life of depth and the search for ultimate meaning 
direction and belonging. I want to I want to read that again. I can you yeah, let's let's do that, right? Spirituality is a way of life that affects and includes every moment of existence. It is at once a contemplative attitude, a disposition to a life of depth and the search for ultimate meaning, direction and belonging. I guess the reason I want to read it twice is just that I I'm like, yes, that's me. Uh, okay. Spirituality draws us into the depths of our being where we come face to face with ourselves, our weakness and with the ultimate mystery. Many understandably prefer to avoid this frightening prospect. Spiritual bypass occurs when a person, I'm, I'm pointing my second finger here. You should imagine that. Spiritual bypass occurs when a person attempts to heal psychological wounds at the spiritual level only and avoids the important, although often difficult and painful, work at the other levels, including the cognitive, physical, emotional and interpersonal. When this occurs, spiritual practice is not integrated into the physical realm of the psyche and, as a result, personal development is less sophisticated than the spiritual. This is obviously an imbalance. It does not have to be like this. But what we are saying is there's a high likelihood that this might occur for this generation. If you're in a religion, well, then that says it all, right? Then I don't even want to deal <laughs> anymore with it. Then that's what it is. But there are other ways you can you can have left the religion and keeping the spiritual bypassing for sure. Because you can be addicted to the ecstasy, getting high. And you can do that, of course, through drugs, but there are many other ways of getting that high. And like I said in the title, you know, go get high, go get the ecstasy, why not? Well, only, I mean, not, it comes in if it is to avoid the emotions. Because it's really, it's really selfish, actually. Because it hurts a lot of people that you are not dealing with your emotions and that you are not attentive to other people's emotions. And actually, just some of the most hurtful things that I've been through in a relationship is that quality where, oh, but we just love everyone. You're just part of anything, everyone, all is one. And you don't care about me. You don't care about getting to know me personally. <laughs> and this is, I've been a part of this too. It's because it's a very easy way to love other people is to not see at all who they are <laughs> and just tap into the love. And there's a place for that. Okay, there's a place for that. But that we, that we are not talking about that spiritual place right now. We're talking about that this is a sort of an escape rather than actually engaging really showing up in the relationship, being there for someone, being there for yourself. Again, with relating to your internal state, uh, being aware of your internal state while you are in relationship. Because I think true love is so much harder than just checking in with unconditional love. It's wonderful to sit in meditation, all of that. There's a place for it but not in, I think, personal relationships. That's, I think it's toxic. <laughs> but these are my opinions now. And that's why I have a podcast and and I get to say these things. But again, it's not something that obviously that every Pluto in Libra has. I'm just saying it is a tendency to not go deep. Pluto is is in Libra to go deep, right? <laughs> to take up the shadow so that we can find the balance but it is really difficult. So often you don't. Often you prefer not to. There are other ways, of course, uh, the shadow can, can show up. Quite, it's quite normal in this generation to have mutual dependency where you really need the other person to feel complete yourself. And I think it, it has the same root in a way because it is going so much away to the other person um, but yeah, I, I think you can ha just do your own personal relationships the way that you want. But the reason that I care so much about spiritual bypass is that it's, it's really painful to hear spiritual truth. Truths about love being used as reasons for not 
seeing who I am and that's so it's it's like a trauma to me whereas the positive response to Pluto and Libra and sextiling to Neptune in Sagittarius is to receive and give love equally so that they relate to themselves and other cultures and whatever they are curious to expand on in a balanced way. What they really need is relationships that evolves with their identities so that they are free to grow and not having to lose the, that relationship or at least then to change the relationship, but that they are free to grow because they can so easily accommodate. They can so easily say, oh, okay, that's that's fine. <laughs> it's painful inside, but let's not look at that. Let's close the eyes. And it's great. It's also everything that's negative has a positive quality to it because it's good that they can actually wait and know when to argue and when it's not appropriate and all of that. That makes them great in many negotiations and and diplomatic situations. But... In relationship, you just have to check, is this a detachment or is it something very intelligent? <laughs> it could be very intelligent and, and it's not really suited for if you want a close and honest uh, relationship. So I'm just going to check my notes here. What didn't I say? Uh, this is the generation that... Uh, when we stop to compromise around relationship, yeah. This is when we stop to compromise around relationship, yeah. What I mean by that is that they did redefine relationship, that they started to divorce, and and that they really used the higher ideals of Libra in a very, I think, successful way um, to, to bring more equality between genders. And, and the thing is that they do need relationships, Pluto and Libras. It's really hard for them without. So it it feels like their need is the need of the partners. And this is where the confusion can become. There's a whole spiritual bypassing thing. That's one side of it. But then in the private home, you can feel you don't really have any need. Or you just have one or two needs. And then you're just happy if your partner is happy. And that's a little bit just bypassing your own emotions. So, because it can create that you, well, one of the Pluto and Libra, if it's in the same generation, you know, one can take the other person for granted and the other side is the one that keeps giving. And But Libra is a cardinal sign, meaning that they will need change and that what they wanted when they married is not what they need today necessarily. It's not enough because Libra has that sense of, of lack that can emerge. So what is it you want to do with that? You can move on together in the partnership and then you can develop and explore new possibilities together. And if the partner is not in on that, then if you don't do anything, there's going to be an attraction to another partner and that partner is going to represent the Pluto and Libra's person's uh, new need. This development can lead to either you're the one being unfaithful or the partner is being unfaithful. But, but to really be happy in a relationship, they need to attract people who's different from themselves, who have other backgrounds because they want their opposite. And unconsciously, through being attracted to opposites, they strengthen the gene pool by bringing in new genes. So it's in this square aspect to cancer, the family, meaning that maybe the family is not so happy. <laughs> uh, you can find yourself between two extremes uh, where you want to make everyone happy, but the family doesn't like your new girlfriend and you absolutely adore her. So this is, I think, really a positive thing that they bring to the table, that they contribute with cultural diversity and um, yeah, being believers, being romantic and keeping to the ideals. And also with Sagittarius, there's also this revival of esoteric discipline. So that's, that's good to say. I think I just needed to let out some steam around bypassing. Okay. Scorpio, here we are. It started in 83 
and it ended in 95. So that is not as long as the other ones. It is almost just 10 years. The title I will choose is Growing Beyond What You Are by Forming Relationships to What You Desire. And the please don't, please don't fuel your death wish. So, Scorpio, it's my generation. It's the shortest generation. And this generation is seeing the abuse of power and a need to restructure society. And in particular, to penetrate what society has labeled taboo. In this time, the culture became occupied with childhood abuse and horror films. And this is where the AIDS crisis happened. Uh, death, sex, taboo, all in one issue. It's in this Scorpio archetype. And this energy can be used to just stay in that hopelessness and be self-destructive. But it can also be used to look closely at how I was hurt and how I hurt others. And then to be courageous with that, be open and honest about that, because otherwise you will have this helplessness that's not examined. And if it's not examined, if you're not conscious about it, if you're not open about it, then you can become very controlling to others, try and fix others. And you're not going to accept other people's vulnerability yourself because you think you know what's best. And you have this very black and white view on life. Because helplessness is a threat to the ego. And that's where transformation comes in. It's one of the places that transformation comes in. So it's uh, from 84. There's a sextile from Pluto to Neptune and Capricorn. So we have Scorpio, we have Capricorn here. And... And that's really the time where the, the collapse of capitalism started. And with this generation, Scorpionic generation, you have on the one side this, give me more, I need more. And then on the other hand, the contraction. There is this thing around focus. Have you heard Scorpio relating to focus? That's actually, when I began with astrology, I never thought of myself as anything to do with Scorpio because I only knew my sign so I didn't know the rest of my chart and and the reason is because focus I don't I can't I'm not very good with focus but then when you dive into it and you get this word listen up over investment over investment when I heard that focus is one one word and you can have many ideas around that but when you hear overinvestment and you kind of open it up you're like I was like oh I certainly do that overinvestment and to depend too much on something could be religion could be other people that is going to bring emotional shocks if you have not been discerning around who you are fusing with this Scorpio it's not a light signature It's a generation where in past lives the rock was pulled under them, which in this life creates boundaries. I mentioned that earlier, that there's also something with boundaries in Scorpio, but it's actually not necessarily really balanced, you know, that balance between thin and thick boundaries. Uh, It's security patterns. Uh, phobias and trust issues, <laughs> that kind of patterns, that kind of boundaries, because it's, it is traumatic adaptations, at least in the beginning. And those security patterns, if they're not challenged, and maybe they are challenged by that emotional shock, then you will feel disempowered, which is a Scorpio theme. Um, and... Uh, because there was a lot of rejection here, to be honest, in this sign. But but in, in terms of relationships, for this generation, a wisdom they have is that it's really better for them not to be with anyone than to settle. Because they need someone that 
is self-aware and that wants to explore these vulnerabilities together and this place of being disempowered. Um, so, so it's really this archetype. It's both the attraction and it's re- the rejection. But let's let's look a little bit deeper at the psychology here. So Scorpio is the sign of reincarnation. Jeffrey Wolfgreen says that it's the need to eliminate all desires that are preventing a direct merging with the ultimate source of power. I really relate to it a lot. You can call it overinvestment to describe something that's not so great or healthy, right? But but there's also this just longing, this urge to fuse, to merge with the ultimate, with the truth, with the divine. But then we have dual desires, meaning there's a conflict between the boundaries, the security patterns, and the growth. So the security patterns are there, and then there's also the urge for personal evolution. I mean, to break down those patterns, and then that is where transformation comes in again. That's where therapy comes in. And it is really through the archetype of Scorpio that the human species examines and analyzes oneself. This is Jeffrey Wolfgreen again. Um, This is where we ask why. Because the desire in Scorpio is to discover the bottom line and their own personal psychology. So this generation has a natural instinct for understanding and helping others around why we are here, the whole why, and the basis for motives and desires. And and I'm still summarizing Jeffrey Wolfgreen, by the way, and to purge what's blocking further growth. Now, what I mentioned in the title is that they can merge with a transformative symbol and become that symbol. They will allow the power of the symbol to enter them and allow for alchemical fusion. And now I, I was a little angry with uh, the, the Jungian book I just mentioned before, but there is something interesting that I'm not, maybe not really ready to talk about. <laughs> I'm not sure I completely understand it, but he did mention two kinds of people where one could just take some truth in and completely identify with it and be that and the other person uh, not but but so i really related to that with the scorpio too also actually the sagittarius but i think this the scorpionic part of it is that it's alchemical you're letting something change you and it's different than with libra because in libra you were learning about who you were through knowing others. Like knowing your opposites is contrasting who you are and you get to know yourself in that way. And in Scorpio, it's it's really important in Scorpio to make choices around who you are involved with and who you commit to because of this deep, deep bonding that happens. And in in a way, Scorpio, uh, in Pluto and Scorpio generation, they already know what they need. Again, remember, there are so many traumatic layers sometimes, but they actually know. But in this life, they're really learning to make appropriate choices, also in terms of sexual partners, because Scorpio is the sexual union. It's the merging of souls. And you can have this experience that you're in a relationship And you want to be committed, but then there's this urge to change. And yeah, yeah, Jeffrey Wolfgreen calls it Black Widow Archetype. I should read that actually, if you want to hear it. Do you want to hear it? Otherwise, I'm I'm sure you've, you've hung up by now. Okay, it is page 155. Just as the female black widow spider magnetically draws the male to her in order to be impregnated and then kills the poor devil. Of course, the male black widow was following his own evolutionary role and desire. So too can these individuals manipulate and maintain a relationship for the duration of a need and then move on to the next relationship. I I recognize it. Okay, often sex is used to get what they want. 
sex may even be the reason for the involvement, although these individuals will resist otherwise to themselves and others. Karmically, this creates a situation wherein the individuals will attract others with whom they have been involved in another life. This situation is always unresolved because there are issues left over from a prior life connection. Compulsion will be the basis of the attraction and in extreme cases, some form of violence can occur. In addition, a large percentage of emotional behavior that is manifested toward each other in this life will be irrational behavior. The prior life separations have not normally gone well. One or both persons will have unconscious memories of being hurt, abused, manipulated, used, and then abandoned. In a typically Pluto in Scorpio way, the need to get back at the other creates this kind of irrational behavior that is vindictive in nature normally, like rational basis exists for such behavior in this life. Although the playing of the old tape can certainly make it appear to be so. Yeah, and then he goes on to say but that you can also call it the die-hard archetype, where you actually stay in a relationship to the bitter end. And then there's this option where you, where you choose a partner who's willing to evolve and change as needs present themselves. And the evolutionary intention is really that this generation is willing to experience life as open-ended and to risk that which constitutes security. Release stagnation, release blocks that will promote growth and the growth of the relationship. And then they will be free from secrets. Okay, putting away the book. But yeah, secrets is, is a big part of this uh, archetype. That's why we have this whole thing around putting light into dark. I remember what I when I talked about Pluto, you can just, you know, turn up the volume on that when you want to know what Pluto and Scorpio then is. It's just more of that. So Scorpio is the consciousness of the dark and the intention is to deepen in order to spot what's in the shadow, to spot the weakness and then transform them. And I mean, so what's the negative part of this? It's really the self-destructiveness, absolutely. And yeah, that because... Because of the relationship to death, it can be self-destructive. And and then, like I read, it, it, it can be really be used just for very selfish purposes if you have these strong security patterns. Because often we talk about it as boundaries, but it's really not, I mean, that we really care about in personal development that it's important for you to have boundaries this is more security patterns something you do unconsciously to keep yourself sure and sure it it avoids you know it, it keeps people out at some level so it is a boundary but it also keeps you from connecting to a deeper part of you and when you are surrounded by those kind of boundaries security patterns then you can really use other people just for gaining whatever you needed from them yeah, so it's a Scorpio kind of survival. And, and what is invited for is, of course, much more open heart relating to your inner, becoming safe in a different way internally, and then, and then risking being hurt, risking trusting other people, actually. Okay, and in a very Scorpionic way, it's really late at night, and I'm usually actually not up. I need to go to bed <laughs> so let me just wrap up here with pluto in sagittarius generation from 95 to well then that is 2008 so that is this 20 years so again scorpio was a shorter generation and it has to do with this elliptical elliptical orbit of pluto the title of sagittarius Pluto Sagittarius is the need to understand and explain phenomenological nature and the universe. And the please don't is, please don't justify your mistakes through some grand philosophy. This generation bring a natural wisdom, a natural talent as storytellers. 
they are headed into the new and the unknown and they want to learn and be amazed this generation has Neptune in Aquarius. So that sextiling from Sagittarius to Aquarius, they're born after the internet. So they have access to everything. And Sagittarius is this infinite possibilities, no limitations. And with Neptune in Aquarius, they can materialize thoughts. How about that? They are here to develop social movements. And again, with Sagittarius, we have the blending of cultures. Maybe they create their own religion. And they definitely go into space. I mean, it's such a high perspective and out there. And it's when we talk about Aquarius, I feel we always risk sounding really stupid <laughs> because who knows about the future, right? But it's some grand solution that we we don't we can't grasp right now. Who would have thought of the internet, you know, before its time? So this is the generation really bringing something wild and out there and are being really open and of course can also uh, come into a lot of depth and <laughs> uh, crazy situations because they do take a lot of risk they need to and in a partnership it's gonna be more important for them with someone who cares for the same values same beliefs and perspectives rather than anything else so yeah that's Pluto and Sagittarius then from 2008 we have Pluto in Capricorn, like I said, it's it's still retrograding back in there. And the title for that is Ethical, Enduring, Mature Generation. And please don't join the patriarchy. So from that generation of Sagittarius, where that's the euphoria, that's the ecstatic, right? So you the, probably you were too optimistic around the economy with the the loans and the, all the smartphone advances and and it had real consequences also it had real consequences for the planet so pluto in capricorn is much more conservative and i i am so curious if you can recognize this actually because i can recognize it in my kids it's crazy just this this trait of this character trait of being responsible and mature and even feeling some guilt, even though it's not a child's fault, but this, this something comes with this package. Uh, Capricorn and Pluto in, in Capricorn having experienced uh, the soul has this, experienced this uh, collapse of structures really. Because you know what, what happened when this generation first was born in, in 2008, the economic crisis, then later the pandemic, the Neptune and Pisces. So it's really this, it's impersonal sign, it's collective global affairs, meaning that this generation, when even though they're in the personal realm, they're going to think about the world and they're going to think about collective structures more than themselves before they think of themselves anyway. So it's a very mature generation being aware of the planet's problems and pollution and climate crisis, global issues. So so they, they suffer from this maturity. In Capricorn, there is suffering and there is a suffering from this maturity because they are tapped into global affairs and, and they can neglect personal connection and and what they can do also from a young age is to lose faith in every structure in government in every system because to them it appears to be corrupt look at it you have pluto i started out by calling it a lens and who knows if i will ever say that again but if it's a lens then it's a lens deep within your gut <laughs> it's deep down in your belly and it's like an extra sense where maybe maybe you're paranoid. We never really know <laughs> with Pluto. You know, an, a negative response to Pluto is becoming completely paranoid. But with Pluto, there's a little bit of paranoia because you need to be a little a step ahead so that you don't get hurt. This is one of the security patterns. This is 
you know, checking for signs of safety with Pluto, right? And in this generation, it is around the global structures. They have seen that it's corrupt. They have seen we cannot rely on them. People have not handled the crisis correct and all of that. So these young guns are going to be role models themselves and leading social movements, for example. Oh, I thought I had notes on Pluto and Aquarius. Oh, that's because I already said so. I already told. I already talked about that. Great. Great. It means that that was it for now. Thank you for enjoying this. <laughs> no, thank you so much for, for being a part of it. And thank you for walking alone right next to me. How about that? How about helping each other finding that place to call whole? It's on the inside, but it's also found and cultivated, I think, through relationships, through authentic relationships. So much love.